So Herb, thank you so much for uh, for volunteering to do this interview. I've been a big fan of yours for a long time, and we've only been able to meet once in person. But I'm very uh, excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it too. Good. And um, so uh, I understand you're you're you have some a new project that you've been working on. You have a book coming out soon. Yes, indeed. Uh... It should be out in three or four weeks. It's in production now. The title is A Psychology of the Soul. I'm not calling it the psychology, but A, because the subject matter is so vast. <laughs> uh, but what I'm calling it is a foray, a, a, a venture as deeply in as I can, but it's really very much based on the uh, healing group readings, the 281 series readings given for the healing group. And there's some surprising, really surprising things. I have read this book cover to cover five times, and it was only in the fifth that I saw this blockbuster uh, concept, and I'm developing that in the book. And uh, of course, I've been talking since um, the 60s about the secret of the golden flower, and um, I'll be tying uh, the healing group readings, especially the revelation readings. Mm -hmm. But speaking of the revelation readings, um, I'm also reading a book, which it should be a required reading for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's called Apocalypse of the uh, Archetype of the Apocalypse. Archetype of the Apocalypse. Oh, and who's and the author? His name is Edinger. He's uh -huh. uh, for, right, you know, he was top man, top Jungian analyst in this uh -huh. country before he died. Uh -huh. He's written a couple of dozen books, but this one, Archetype of the Apocalypse, is um, ties in with the Revelation readings and the Casey interpretation, but also um, I've been studying and restudying the World Affairs readings. Mm -hmm. They gave about twenty nine or thirty readings called the World Affairs readings. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, he says um, there will be a revolution in this country. There will be blood running in the streets. There will be a brother against brother. Mm -hmm. And um, the, you know, you read that kind of thing, and you think, well, that's that's down the road. Mm -hmm. We may we may be approaching the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to discuss this specifically is because in this book by Edinger. He says, the more, it'll be easier on us all, the more people who understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And if you want to understand what's going on, reading the Revelation 17 and 18, those verses, those chapters, mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the destruction of Babylon. And we are Babylon now, that's the lower self. Mm -hmm. just, and, I'll just repeat it because it's breaking up a little bit. But I'm saying you're talking about Babylon, the destruction yes. of Babylon. Yes. Right. And we are Babylon now. And Babylon is the lower self. Mm -hmm. And the worst this come out all over the world. I mean, mm -hmm. there's poverty. I just read this morning, locusts threatening the world health uh, food supply yes. and wars and uh, people brandishing their uh, AR. 15s. In, in one of these readings that I'm talking about in the healing group readings, it says this amazing thing that we're co-creators with God and we have the ability to think of creating weapons to destroy our fellow man. And then he says only not realizing that you're destroying yourself. So the, um, the lovers of these weapons or the builders of these are simply building up some karma for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, an AK-47 and an AR-15 has nothing to do with um, loving your neighbor or loving your enemy. It doesn't. And, um, you know, fear, perfect love is out fear. And people get wept because they're fearful. No matter what happens, uh, people rush to the gun stores to get more weapons. 
and the thing they're looking for safety and they they want more weapons because it's not satisfying it doesn't it doesn't allay your sense of fear mm -hmm. but so you say well i have five ar 50s maybe if i get another one but it's like money and greed you know if you have two million dollars you think well i really need four million uh, because having that money doesn't make you feel secure there's only one safe place in the universe and that's mm -hmm in attunement with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. There's people that have entire arsenals. They're just uh, hundreds of, of these uh, machine guns. It's like having uh, in the bank and, and trying to run another. Um, they get more because it's an addiction that isn't satisfied by that. And, and so um, to try to satisfy the addiction, they pursue the same course. Mm -hmm. and, it never makes you really feel safe. Yeah, it doesn't fill. Doesn't exactly. fill. And so, do you do you see that just basically we're it's going to be it's going to get worse before it gets better? Yes. And what's interesting is the world affairs readings are given back in the thirties, and um, Jung was talking about this back in those times as well. Mm -hmm. He 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 calls it an, a constellation of the apocalyptic archetype. Mm -hmm. and as, and he's talking about the world. World, we we are interested in the self, as in mm -hmm. rebel interpretation of the self. But he says, starting with the Holocaust or um, the World War One, and then World War Two, and then um, what we can do is list these things: the ecology of the planet, mm -hmm. the uh, virus that's spreading, and people ignoring. Uh, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Uh, the list, the list is too long. It's but if you just list together, that's what Jung would call the constellation of the archetype of the apocalypse. And what Edinger says is, uh, the more people understand what's going on, what is going on is if you read about the destruction of Babylon and the revolution. 17 and 18 is this this acquisition of lifestyle in which we're uh, planted up for garbage mm -hmm. to an end the destruction of the ecology of the planet and climate change has to come to an end but we're not going to give up on it easily and so we're all going to have to go through some serious pain but if we understand that it's um, the, the best way to think about it is a woman in tra travail. And those are biblical words that the world is in travail, which means mm -hmm. travail means it's about to give birth to a new life. Mm -hmm. And destruction of, the, of Babylon is replaced by the um, new Jerusalem, which is the higher self. Mm -hmm. So... All of us, I mean, talking about the um, eight or so billion of us, have to turn loose of that lower self because the higher self is coming in and it's going to squeeze out evil. It's going to squeeze out self-centeredness and, um, and destructive business and, and ecological practices. And so it's like with, with my little little knowledge of the revelation, it's sort of what's being talked about with the Antichrist consciousness, kind of hatred, greed, self-aggrandizing, all these kind of lower ego aspects. So that's what's having to get uh, well, kind of washed yeah. out. Part of the archetype, the apocalypse, is the archetype of the attic. And they ask Casey, uh, what's the spirit? of the Antichrist. He says the spirit of love is kindness, gentleness, brotherly love. The Antichrist uses these words, mm -hmm. content, strife, fault finding, lovers of self, lovers of praise. You don't have to look very far to find content, strife finding, lovers of self, lovers of praise. Mm -hmm. So we actually are in the times not only of the apocalypse, but of the Antichrist, and it, that's an archetype too. And although we might point to one person, and, and Jung says the coming of the Antichrist is inevitable. Mm -hmm. 
and and what he's saying psychologically is contention, strife, fault finding, lovers of self, lovers of praise. That's the lower self mm-hmm. has to be gotten rid of. Mm-hmm. So um, more than any of us imagine, our prayers, our meditation and prayers can have a helpful effect on this. We've got to become meditators. Get your Search for God book out and read that first section on meditation and then uh, start doing it because um, the readings say that more can be accomplished by prayer many times than actual service. And so we see a problem where we want to rush out and fix it. Better to get centered and meditate and pray and then see what guidance we get to be of help. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, that's it's, great. That's great counsel. It's, uh, it's, Go a scary, it's going to be a scary, difficult time for the world. Mm-hmm. And then what you were saying and the author of this, uh, Edinger, I think you said his name was. And yes. so he's saying the more, the more that people can become aware that there's this kind of travail going on. And how, 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 would, you, how would you say it? What are the benefits of becoming aware of it? And how can people become more aware? Well, uh, first, we, um, we need to understand something more about time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Henry David Thoreau once um, went into the woods and uh, wrapped his lunch up uh, in a newspaper. And when lunchtime came, he opened it up and read it and enjoyed his lunch. And then he realized it was six months old. And he said, the, um, the story is the same. <laughs> today as it was six months ago. What he, he, he then says, don't read the times. He was reading the conquered times. Yeah. Don't read the times, read the eternities. Now, the readings talk about eons, mm-hmm. and they say the work for the needs of the souls of mankind has gone down through thousands and millions of years for thousands, hundreds and thousands, hundreds and thousands of years yet to come. So if we know that, that this is a, a cleansing, that, that there are things like, the, uh, like pollution and, and uh, the trash that's destroying the oceans, if we know that these have to be gotten rid of and that the purpose of the, of the apocalypse is to give us a start so that we can, in other words, the billionaires are not going to give up on their billionaires to feed the homeless. Mm-hmm. It's going to take something more dramatic than that. Mm-hmm. And so if we know that there's a purpose behind this and that it, God is at work in bringing about a dramatic change so that we as souls can incarnate again in a more hospitable environment. But again, if you see, you see, what if we saw the continuation of everyone buying an AR-14? What if we saw a continuation of filling up the trash heaps and, and uh, destroying the habitability of the ocean? For See, if we, if we say, what if these things continue the way they're going? What if the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer? So the, if we understand the meaning that this is God's grace giving us a fresh um, start. And um, these same readings, the um, healing group readings, say there will be a thousand years of peace. Mm-hmm. And he tells those readers, be ye all determined to be in that number. So we want to become lovers of each other, lovers of God, lovers of ourselves, lovers of enemy. Now that's the, that's the hard one. Mm-hmm. And what I've discovered is um, the spirit of the Antichrist um, strife, fault finding, contention. Hate, yeah. yeah. See, that, that, um, that spirit uh, is so self-centered. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so we cut ourselves off um, and we become haters. But if if the righteous become self-righteous and become haters of the haters, then, then both sides are haters. Mm-hmm. And, uh, 
and and so there's uh, all of us who see what's going on and concern have to be more generous of spirit, more loving, less condemnative. And we can do that if we realize all of us were children of the most high. Every soul is a child of God and that things have to be corrected to, to make this planetary experience more uh, what it's meant to be, which is to learn about our relationship to God. So, so your counsel is for people at this time to kind of stop and think or stop and meditate, stop and pray, and just get attuned with the transitions that are going afoot. Not to, not to become victims of fear, but to turn inward. And in a way, uh, I, the thought I've had is it's almost like we're called to be witnesses, yes. to be con- conscious witnesses of what's happening. That's exactly it. And... Um, you know, all of us are going to die anyway. Uh, if I'm fearful about uh, my 401k running out next month and I die tonight. Uh, Anna and I, we've been, by the way, you need to talk with Anne about her work. and I her. do. I will. I, I have that on the agenda. Oh, good. Um, we say, you know, we could drop dead tonight. And, and so all of this, uh, here's a guy that, It's worth a hundred billion dollars. When he drops dead, he's not going to carry a penny with him. No. And his his heirs are going to spend it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So um, the the point about is trying to make is that realizing that that there's this impermanence to your own physical life. Mm -hmm. Don't get upset, upset about what may be happening on the planet because it's, um, it's cleanup time. It really mm-hmm. is. I'm, and you know, more and more, we wonder, God is love. What about the wrath, the wrath of God? Mm-hmm. He seems very clear on this. The so-called biblical wrath of God is simply meeting our karma. And um, it's the list for the United States of America, the people of America for the past 400 years. We've generated <laughs> more than enough uh, un- unpleasant karma. We have, you know, we're still Navajo people here in Arizona don't have electricity or running water, 30%. Mm-hmm. Um, and here in Arizona, one out of every four or five children goes to bed hungry. And the New York billionaires, they don't even know what to do with their, all the money. Uh, it just sits there. Mm-hmm. And so these inequalities uh, have to be corrected. And since we're not going to do it eagerly and voluntarily, the karmic aspect um, will help us out. God's, God is love and God is law. And it sounds like a strange thing, but to say God is lawful. And so, Karma is a form of God's love that shows us what we've sown. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so the wrath of God really not wrath. It is us meeting the consequences of our own choices. And just think about what, what are the choices that people are making? Mm-hmm. And um, I've encouraged people to um, put their religion to work. Don't just have a religion. But then... Casey, he says some surprising things about this. On the one hand, you, we need to respect every person of, of every faith. And yet, every faith is not true. Uh, they, the facts, for example, of reincarnation, they're factual. And, um, and so Christian theology is in neglecting that fact because of an interest. And to be a, um, deeply... Uh, involved soul and spiritual growth, the understanding of reincarnation is a requirement. Mm-hmm. So there's place in the uh, Revelation and also in Ezekiel that in which the person is given a rod which to measure the temple. What Casey says that is, is to once you've achieved, and, and we, we're at a stage of relative enlightenment, once you've achieved, then what is going to be the size of your temple? And, and what he's saying is that whether you're Protestant or Catholic, 
that can be narrowing for you. Uh, and it's sad how, um, you know, for the Catholics to say nobody can go to heaven except Catholics. Mm -hmm. See how small a temple that is? Mm -hmm. Whereas God is not willing that any soul should die. Mm -hmm. So I, the more religious we get, sometimes the more uh, we need to interpret religion to mean bound and bound mm -hmm. in our limitations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I remember that passage yeah, about yeah. measuring the temple. Um, but one of the things I remember from Casey also, and I think you're alluding to it, is that he talked about when, when the disparity between wealth and poverty gets too great, it foments revolution. And I think if you look at the French Revolution, Russian Revolution, those were the factors. But I think that we've never seen a disparity between wealth and poverty like we do now in this uh, in this country, but it seems like revolution in the old fashioned way, I mean, in the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the king's men and the common people had the same weapons. And so it's in modern times, you can't really take up arms against the government. It's the, the you know, the, the government has planes, they have tanks. And so it seems like, I guess it's being put into God's hands to deal with this leveling, as Casey would call it. Well, um you mentioned the point because it's a big point repeated in the world affairs readings that um, labor works and capital works and if labor doesn't get its share of the profits then it's going to revol uh, revolt mm -hmm. as it should and that was in the third and now 2020 it's worse it's not it's not better than it mm -hmm. was it's worse no. so the um and these are what, he, as you point out, these are what he says foment revolution. Mm -hmm. And that's also the basis of why we might have the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, being the basis of a, of a revolution, of brother killing brother. And now, have, oh, go ahead. It's, uh, it's sobering. Now, now, I know that in the Search for God material, um, Casey talked about the period of 1958 to 1998 you know, that 40 year period, which we've all, we've all lived through that incredible period of time. Now there's been some, uh, it's not quite Casey, but there's some, been some focus on the next 40 years. So the 40 years of 58 to 98, and then the 1998 to 2038. Have you thought about that? Have you considered anything about what's coming in this 40 year period that we're in now? I haven't studied that really. And so it's, it's something I need to look into, but I can tell you this, in that testing period, 58 to 98, mm -hmm. I think we failed. Say that again? I think we failed. Mm -hmm. I don't think we passed the test. <laughs> yes. Uh, so immediately after that, there's 9-11 and the war in Afghanistan. And, uh, and, and so um, we're, um, I think that period was a time in which some, change could have been made. Mm -hmm. and now I think we're simply into karma. Mm -hmm. now, karma, uh, it's not punishment, it's meeting self and we need to pray and pray and pray for others and ourselves. And our prayer is help us to learn our lessons gently. And, and we can learn lessons through spiritual understanding or we can play them out um, in actual physical manifestation. And we don't need to do that, but we seem on it. Mm -hmm. But the, I hope we have a, another 40 year period of, of grace in which there might be some progress made, but I don't find that in the Casey readings. It mm -hmm. may be, it may be so. Mm -hmm. Well, it's um, John Van Auken wrote the, he wrote a book about the, the pyramid inch and the timeline of the great pyramid and he timed it out to be 2038. And so I was just, to me, it was interesting that we had that 40 year period and then the subsequent 40 year. And I, when I try to, I just think well, we're all here in that 80 year period. And I wonder if um, as a soul group that we've incarnated, that we're here to somehow I feel that to, to pass the baton from 58 to 2038, that somehow we hold in consciousness something that lifts 
so that we can make it so that, that between now and I mean, not that 2038 is any kind of magic number, all of a sudden everything shifts. But I wonder if even if we're thinking of the transition from the Piscean age, to the Aquarian age, if somehow, you know, I, um, I remember uh, I wanted to uh, buy a motorcycle when I was in college and I took a safety class. And one of the things I remember from the class is that they said, you have to be most careful at intersections because at intersections is where most accidents happen, yeah. not when you're going straight. And I'm thinking, you know, cosmically, we're kind of at an intersection between the, these two ages. And I think that there's, there's something bumpy about this. And, I, and I'm hoping that it's, you know, you know, it probably won't be necessarily in our lifetimes, but somehow that we, we were able to, to hold some essence of consciousness that can, uh, you know, that hopefully we can, pass on the baton to another generation that continues the work so that we can make it, as you say, to the thousand years of peace. That would be wonderful. Uh, in the meantime, <laughs> buckle up your seatbelt. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so 98 to 38 um, may not. Yeah, no, it's not going to be a, a piece of cake. No, uh, it may not keep us away from this uh, archetype of the apocalypse. One thing that I've felt, and I think I've shared it with other people in the, in the spiritual community, is just a feeling of a need to simplify things, to just yeah. get less, like you're saying, the, the archetype of the addict, get less addicted to things outside of yourself, the creature comforts, uh, money, you know, kind of paring down as much as you can so that your, your footprint is as, is as lean as it can be. Well, some people say that you monitor everything. If you have, you know, uh, I found uh, someone gave me a gun and I found, I'm always thinking about how am I going to use this? Am I going to kill somebody if they come in the house? Am I going to the target practice? And I got rid of it because I was monitoring that. And so everything we have, we kind of monitor and it picks up our subconscious space instead of our subconscious <laughs> to the, the end. It you know? does I had that experience with um, a sports car. You know, I, I was, um, I, I have a master's degree in social work and I had in my mind, I'd like to, I'd love to have a Porsche, but I thought, oh, you know, that's bad. You shouldn't have a Porsche. But I read Paramahansa Yogananda's at that time, um, the biogra uh, biography of a yogi. And his teacher said, you know, you have to be careful what you hold on to because you'll reincarnate if you have that desire. So I said, okay, let me go and, and, and buy a Porsche. So I had a Porsche for three years and I'm glad I did it because now when I see a Porsche going by, I don't have any clinging yeah. aspect. But after, by, the, by those three years, it was just like you said with the gun, the, the, the Porsche owned me more than I owned the Porsche. I was always, you know, and I, I was always concerned where I was gonna park it and how to garage it. And, and I remember one time I was driving down the road and a car hit a bump and the hubcap started running right towards my car, towards the Porsche. And I remember trying to steer out of the way and the, and the hubcap, I've never have a, had a hubcap ever hit me before, but it just seemed like it was, I was attracting that fear of mm -hmm. this possession that I wanted to protect. I was so fearful that something would happen to it, I actually attracted it. So when I sold it, I was very happy <laughs> just to get rid of it. But I'm in a way, I'm glad I had it because it was a, a great learning experience for me. Right. Well, all of us make uh, poor choices or mistakes or whatever we want to call them. And yeah. uh, we have these opportunities. And if we learn from them uh, and accept uh, God's forgiveness and grace, uh, then we go on. Uh, if we cling to it, oh, dear, I wish I hadn't sold that after all. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the karma to deal with. And so we all make mistakes. We all have the opportunity to leave those behind as we forgive ourselves and others and get ourselves more attuned. But the, um, the times that are ahead of us, um, right now, you know, we're practicing social distancing. We wear our masks. It's just recently uh, required here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And um, what is that trying to tell us? Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe we ought to shut up. <laughs> um, and watch, watch what kind of air we're breathing. But um, yeah, and I think it also makes us all kind of anonymous. You know, you're just kind of your. <laughs> yeah, you, you, don't blame me. Yeah, you can't quite see people's emotion. You can't see their face. You can't see if they're smiling or not. It's very. It, there's a lot of symbology to just kind of 
you know, I assume we've all been wearing masks all along anyway. We might as well wear one physically. <laughs> so, uh, there's an interesting thing about it. Uh, it's almost as though um, if you practice social distancing and, uh, and wear a mask, uh, that you don't recognize that cell in there. And I, you don't recognize I, what? Say that again. The what? The, a soul. S O U. Oh, the soul. Right. Yes. And um, I've because I believe that every soul is a child of the Most High. Every time I see a person, I know this is a God being, mm -hmm. and I make a practice of saying hello to strangers or no matter what. But I'm getting less response from people with with masks on. You know, I say good morning or have a good day or something, and uh, yeah. and and people are fearful, even yes. uh, not just of the bug, but uh, in in a general way. Yes. Well, people when they see you, they cross the street, and then you know we're just trying to, and it, it's like we're 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 profiling everybody. Like a human is dangerous, and so we we avoid contact as much as we can. And then people, so, sometimes I've seen people actually turn away from me and face a wall. Like they, they don't even want to make eye contact. <laughs> we must become meditators and prayers. And uh, the only way for prayer to be really effective is for us to be centered. So you have to meditate. The, the idea is that the, um, the energies have to be raised all the way from the lower center to the highest. Mm -hmm. And if we're fearful or angry or resentful or, uh, or self-centered, um, the energies don't go all the way up. And so our, what Casey says in the healing group readings is to raise the energies up to the pineal. Those secretions overflow. That's the blood of the lamb. Do you mean the pineal or the pituitary? Pineal. The pineal? Raise the energy. Yes. Oh. I didn't. I'd read Search for God for 40 years because, before I saw this one line that says, raise the energies to vanille, then those hormones overflow and tune up the body. And then you go to the highest center, the kingdom and the power and the glory. The power is in the blood of the lamb, which is the vanille secretions overflowing to tune up mm -hmm. the body. That's the power. Then the glory. Glory, Casey says, is the ability to serve. Mm -hmm. So you disseminate the pineal hormones to the body, and then you disseminate your attunement as you pray for others. He says, on the wings of thought, see it disseminated from the forehead. So the, uh, the energies, when, when, we, when we say the 23rd Psalm, my cup runneth over, mm -hmm. I had thought for decades that that was the pituitary. I but did on, too. On reading this in the search for God, the cup that overflows is the pineal. Oh. And then once it overflows and heals the cells of the body, then the energy can rise. You disseminate that to the, the body. And then with the attunement, you disseminate your healing thoughts from the pituitary. Oh, I see. So the, the pineal is personal and the uh, pituitary is for others. Yes, exactly. So the, the readings you, the Lord, disseminated in, in, in both cases. The pineal secretions are disseminated to the body, mm -hmm. or the cells of the body. And then, um, then you can pray effectively for others. And so that's why we insist meditate and then pray um i've worked with a formula for years uh, peter um i say pray meditate pray and once you work with that sequence then the first prayers prayers of forgiveness prayers of attunement prayers of protection prayers of thanksgiving to prepare you to meditate and once you have prepared yourself through those prayers and meditate, then you're fit or attuned enough to pray effectively for others. Oh. It's pray, meditate, pray. Oh, okay. And um, all of our, you know, all of our prayers are helpful, but they're not powerful uh, as they could be. 
if we got a tune, meditated, and then sent them out from the pituitary. Now, now what is your, um, what's your practice like? Let's say on a daily basis, how do you go about? Well, one of the most important things, um, the 91st Psalm says, mm -hmm. He dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Mm -hmm. That Psalm goes on to say, A thousand will fall at your right hand and 10,000 at your side. Mm -hmm. so this is he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. What is that? That's the, that's the pituitary. That's the highest center. Mm -hmm. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. So the dwelling place as the, in the um, pituitary is um, um, part of what I practice. I, I try to have a sense of, of and I, I'm saying always, always through the day, he who dwells in the secret place in the most high. Mm -hmm. And you do that, you can actually feel the warmth at the forehead like you do in deep meditation. Mm -hmm. so part of my practice is to try throughout the day to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Um, Case said, um, one that was directed by the pituitary alone for seven years could be light to the world. Mm -hmm. If you have the right purpose. Mm -hmm. But the single is a purpose. And it goes the other way. If the singleness of purpose is self, then he says you can become like a, a Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. But then my other part of, uh, of uh, daily preparation, I get up around 4.30 or 5, 5.30, and I spend at least an hour in prayer and meditation and then prayer. And, uh, and then I try through the day to... Um, there's several things during the day that give me a few minutes to um, get centered again, get a sense of dwelling in the sacred place of the Most High, and then sending out prayers to others. Mm -hmm. I also, for years, I, I've hardly spent a day in which I don't read some Edgar Casey readings. They, they are so underappreciated. So, um, like this book. Um, Meditation One, which is the 281 series for the Glad Helpers. Um, I've read it cover to cover five times, and I'm still discovering extraordinary things about it. Mm -hmm. This Home Library series, uh, wise men for thousands of years would have given their lives to had access to the information we have. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, I find Casey enthusiasts have been studying for years who don't really read the readings. Let me t give you a confession. Mm -hmm. I first started trying to understand the Casey interpretation of the readings of the Revelation in 1953. I visited the beach. I picked up an early copy of an interpretation of the Revelation. And I just realized, and I've taught classes on it all over the country and not just to ARE, but to unity and so on. Um, I realized I, I don't understand that book yet. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't studied the physiology of the body. And Casey's mm -hmm. big is you need to study the anatomy and physiology of the body because it's a temple. Mm -hmm. It's not throw away something. It is a gift that with this instrument, you can attune to God. And, and he says, he, he equates universal consciousness with God. Mm -hmm. He says, don't settle for anything less than the universal consciousness. And every soul, every one of us has the potential of that. Mm -hmm. we, we're not all likely to work on that in this incarnation, but, but we, need to, we need to really sense how powerful the attuned soul can be. And yeah, that's, thank you. That's very, 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 very powerful. I understand you're doing a lot of work with hypnosis. And yes. uh, you may have noticed that the very first page of the, of the, um, I, is it the, is it, there's a river text or is it the philosophy chapter in the back? But 
in that first page, it says, this story properly belongs to the history of hypnosis. And, and what hypnosis is about with respect to Casey is being able to put consciousness aside so that you can tune in on the, that deep subconscious mm -hmm. that makes you, really connects you with the soul. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, I encourage people in terms of learning to meditate to study some about hypnotic induction, mm -hmm. visualization, relaxation, breathing. These all relate to helping you get attuned in um, meditation, but they're hypnotic induction techniques. Yeah, there's a lot that I've um, slowly come to understand. You know, I just one thing led to another and I got involved with hypnosis and then, then with regression and, um, you know, reading revelation when, when Casey identifies the twins as having to do with our past life influences and our astrology, I was very impressed because it came to me at a time where I was wondering if it was the best, um, place for me to pour my life force into helping people tap into past lives or soul forces. So that helped me realize that, that that was uh, a good uh, piece of work. And then I also found that it helps people, you know, uh, Houston Smith used to come to ARE and give lectures. And I remember one time he said that he had read two separate sources. And one said that one of the things most uh, important for a soul in the physical body and the human experience is a transcendent experience. And then he read another source that said one of the things that's most lacking for humans are transcendent experiences. And so I think that's why a lot of people have turned to drugs and psychedelics to have transcendent experiences. But what I've been happy to see is that if a person is suggestible through hypnosis, they can experience something of the divine. And I've seen how the, people get touched by that. And it, um, it almost like shifts an experience for many people that they, they become more aligned, like it sets something in motion that it's almost like what I hear when, when somebody would get a Casey reading for some, it would, it would awaken them to something different. And that's what I found. That's what's drawn me to doing regressions is that, that catalyst, that kind of um, giving God a chance, so to speak. You just said, um, um, I will bring all things to your remembrance. Yes. And so we, as souls, uh, billions of years old, we have a lot in the subconscious and yes. we have, there's gifts that we've prepared for ourselves. Maybe 500 years ago, you were a great painter and, and you worked at it and you were accomplished and mm -hmm. it's there to be awakened. Mm -hmm. What we want to awaken is the gifts that we've presented ourselves through the grace of God to enable us to become more fully who we are and and so we have bank accounts that around all over the place we haven't opened up. We don't know about it. Yes. I say that sometimes where a lot of people are beggars and they don't realize they're karmic millionaires. They just have to go to the bank and collect it. Exactly. And so that's one of the things that hypnosis can help you, help you do. Regression and um, getting in touch with that um, past talent or gift or awareness. Now, I read uh, when I was reading uh, one of your bios that you actually uh, either trained or you had some experience with Milton Erickson. Yeah. Um, once I finished graduate school and went to San Antonio um, for a year there, I was working with the School of Aerospace Medicine. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of money. And they brought Erickson in for a weekend workshop. And mm -hmm. so Friday night, Saturday, Sunday morning. Um, and... Um, part of why that was so special is because he had a unique approach to, um, to hypnosis. Um, some people have used the term father and mother hypnosis. There's a, there's a strong sleep now, and mm -hmm. then the, there's the more gentle and he had this gentle and, and he was, he, the way he worked, um, was, was fascinating. And so I, I learned a lot about hypnosis. Yeah, that. I've seen I've seen some of his videos. You know, that the, the, there's a series that they have on him teaching it, and that's the sense I got that it was um, there wasn't like a, as soon as you walked into the room, the session was beginning. There wasn't a beginning, middle, and end. It was just this 
the whole the whole you know i wonder what if you went out for a drink with him he would still be <laughs> still be Probably making not. suggestions <laughs> but the, the approach um, that he had was kind of a confusion method yeah he would start off on one line and then shift something that's completely unrelated and he kind of gets your mind confused and then that kind of opens you up to yes. to the suggestion to yeah move i I've not had, I've tried to use the confusion technique and it's just, um, it's almost like I think you have to really have a lot of practice with it. You know, I remember he says something like, have you ever been in the back seat of a car and tried to put on the brakes? You know, and you're yeah. just, you're kind of like, what? <laughs> so it kind of like it blows your mind and then you just kind of, uh, you become suggestible. The thing that got me really interested in hypnosis was uh, Franz Pulgar, who was a stage hypnotist. Mm -hmm. twice in high school in Lubbock in the 40s. Mm -hmm. um, he was good. And, and so I read his um, autobiography, a uh, story of a hypnotist. He was injured in World War I. And like uh, many people uh, from an injury, woke up when he woke up in the hospital, he was clairvoyant. And so he was not just a skilled hypnotist, he was psychic. Uh -huh. And so he worked with the hypnotic and the psychic skills together. And uh, I, I, of the, all the hypnotists I've seen, he was unique. Was he doing stage hypnosis or was he doing it for it's, healing? No, it was stage hypnosis. Ah. But, oh, interesting. Um, it, was, it was real, you know. Yeah. He had the real thing. Yeah, so you have been uh, on quite a, a learning journey in your life you've had these different stops along your along your path and just it seems like you've been just retaining so much and, and so it's i'm really glad to hear that you're you're uh, you know what what incredible spiritual timing that i'm sure when you started the book you had no idea that it was going to come out in a time of a pandemic riots <laughs> happening <laughs> this is true yeah the um the title of the book is A Psychology of the Soul, has a subtitle, um, From the Infinite into the Finite. And so the book is part one, part two. Yeah. One is From the Infinite to the Finite, and it is a detailed um, um, dialogue or narrative of my growth experiences from grade school to high school to and the military and Casey and um, on up through the present. So what I'm trying to do is give a background for the reader to say, uh, I've been working on this for a while. And so uh, at least lend me your ear for a minute to consider a psychology of the soul. And so is the book that's coming out soon, is that part one and two together? Oh, okay. And then how can people, how can I get your book? Like, how, where is it for sale? Uh, I, I really I wish I could tell you that and uh, with a long list. But um, I'm working with Friesen Press out of uh, Vancouver, uh, Victoria. It's a Canadian company. Yes. And, um, and I think I've contracted for them to put it on Amazon and, and other places. So I don't okay. know. But... Um, be sure to talk with me in a month or so. <laughs> yes, I, I, I want very much to get a copy and also to help you promote it. Now, I know that we, we started here. This was um, kind of getting connected over Zoom. Now, have you thought of doing um, classes? Like, have you thought of teaching over using technology to reach people? Well, I don't, I don't know anything about it, really. This is uh, my third exposure to Zoom. And yeah. I and not really inclined of trying to learn all of this. So, well, I'll set up a I'll set up a class with, for the two of us, and we'll just go fifty fifty. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, um, uh, I need I need to get as many avenues for exposure as I can. But there's right now with 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 people social distancing, it's a it's a real boon. Um, as you probably know, I've started a Facebook, a private Facebook group, and it's just been 
uh, a magnet for people just wanting a place to to meet and to learn, you know, while they're staying at home. And I think that this situation isn't going to change anytime really soon. I think more and more people are going to be working from home. So we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this, but I think that if you wanted to have like a zoom class that goes along with your book, almost like when it comes out, you could, you could do a course like, like we're doing right now where you go through the book chapter by or you know, section by section and, and answer questions. Zoom becomes like, it's a classroom, you know, you can, you could have every, it's like the Brady Bunch, you have everyone there. And then if it's more than 20, I think it's just, then it just becomes, you, you know, less interactive, but, um, it, you know, very, very, uh, it's pretty user friendly. So anyway, just a thought, I think that there's a, uh, you're, you're just a, um, a gem that I think uh, if there, if, if I can get you out more public, I think lifetimes of my own karma will be, <laughs> will be helped. <laughs> Very kind and generous. Uh, in truth, uh, the student of the Casey readings is the one that's going to be most interested in this book because yes. I'm pretty heavy on the, the readings here. Yes. And, um, advancing him as, as being a bigger than a lot of people think of. Yes. They ask, um, should we represent this as coming from the Christ? Mm -hmm. He said, that is the condition but even that limits. Mm -hmm. And so he is very cautious about um, indicating the source, but um, this, um, uh, I, I write in the book, there's not anything, there's not anything available like the Casey readings mm -hmm. um, because it's holistic. It covers every aspect of your life, relationships, health, business, um, especially all the spiritual stuff and the, um, for example, there's a complete physiology in the readings that, that medicine even today doesn't even understand. He says, what? yeah, go ahead. He says, um, some of these processes are not found in a dead body. You can't um, do a, um, an autopsy or a, viv a vivisection. Yeah. So um, I, I would appreciate getting a book to you, getting a response, talking with you about it. And any, any, um, because I think, uh, you know, every, every one who writes a book thinks it's important, but, uh, I'm, I'm trying to address some really uh, major soul issues. And, and I, I hope, um, I, I, can get access, access to it. I think people are very, very hungry for a spiritual understanding of these times that we're living through. I think there's, there's a hope that there, there's something they can tie, you know, a mast that they can tie themselves to in this time. And so I think that um, it's a hungry world. And, and while the, the ARE has maybe, you know, uh, 15, 18,000 physical members, but when you look at the, the online presence, it's in the hundreds of thousands. So there's hundreds of thousands of people around the world that tune in to the Edgar Casey Facebook page or Instagram. So there's, a, there's an interest in it, but it's, um, it's almost like um, this new generation has gotten very used to technology and accessing uh, information through technology. So I think having some kind of um, personal touch connected with the book I think would, would really help people um, because, you know, that people learn in such different ways. And so having you as a mentor, as they go through the book, I just think that would be um, <laughs> incredible. It'd be fun for me to be sure. Um, yeah. Just um, because I've worked so hard and trying to understand. Yes. You uh, must, you must have a headache. There's so much knowledge in there <laughs> that you just got to get out. <laughs> Well, I remember a passage about Paul being before one of the kings and saying, uh, your, your knowledge overwhelmed me, you know, it's too much. And, and you feel like, um, you know, you really eager when you, when you come across something so helpful and profound, you want to share it. Yeah. And so uh, I... Uh, well, well, I found when I started my Facebook, private Facebook group, that it was almost like, um, I'll use an analogy of the body, like a, like a release of certain constipation, 
Like there was a lot inside and it just gave me a, a, a flow. And so I felt better and communicating with people. So it just feels like, um, you know, as you're saying with prayer meditation, that's wonderful, but then there becomes a buildup of these energies and how to express them. And so I found that that was a very helpful, uh, constructive way for me to, to share and interface with people that are hungry and seeking spiritual guidance in these challenging times. I think, um, I think you need um, audio and video and interpersonal conversation and reading and everything. Um, in this book, I'm addressing a really, really heretical, difficult topic. And the reading says, um, says this will take much meditation and study. At first you won't understand it. Mm -hmm. Then when you understand it, you won't be able to put it into words. And, and then finally, when you are convinced that you understand it, when you really do, then write about it and share it with others. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I spent several months, maybe three months, just trying to work on finding a way to understand what that series of readings meant, how to understand it, and how to put it into words and share it. So uh, it's, uh, it's not going to be easy reading, and, uh, and it's, it's really a work for the student. It, it won't skim fast, uh, and uh, it's, it's very heretical because I really take uh, Christian theology to task, and science as well. Well, you're very, um, you may not know this, but you're, you're very, you're remembered and you're incredibly well thought of. You know, it's, as I've told people in, in the community about having the opportunity to speak with you, there's a lot of what they call buzz. There's a lot of excitement about that. And I, I remember that there was, you know, when I came to ARE and was, had read your books and for some reason, you know, because of personal, you know, karmic stuff, you know, it took years to get you back. I was there when you came back, I guess five or so years ago. And I remember when Charles Thomas introduced you, he said, her Purrier considered to be the foremost interpreter of the Casey readings. And I think that that is, that is clearly true. And I think that anyone, you know, I think that there's, there's a lot of um, Casey light out there. There's just a lot of you know, new age kind of let's just take a little quote of Edgar Casey's and, and, and get excited about it. But I think about in-depth understanding of what Edgar Casey was trying to, to lead us through as a humanity. I mean, you're, it just that you're, you're here, we're having this conversation and we can have more and we can include more and more people in this conversation and bring more and more light into consciousness. I think it's very, very exciting. And in a way, it's a little bit of a mandate, perhaps. Oh, good. Well, I appreciate that positive feedback. And uh, I want to say that uh, I'm so excited about the readings, and I continue to be. And I really want to share it. I just think, wow, this is something, you know, you want to tell somebody about it. Well, and there's a there's an Edgar Casey Book of Revelations private study group on Facebook, and it has over a thousand members. So can you imagine if we advertise to that group, her Purrier is going to be doing an online class. So you've got at least a thousand <laughs> people that would sign up. You know what, uh, some years ago, um, Dan Millman, who wrote the, the something of the spiritual warrior. Yes. Well, he was asking us about our classes and we said, oh, we get like um, 200 people that attend our classes. And then he said, oh, that's great. And we said, well, how many at attend your classes, Dan? He says, well, you know, how much do you charge? I charge a dollar a person to attend a class. Well, how many people do you get? 40,000, 40,000 people <laughs> attending his classes. So, so it's just the, with technology, the reach that's possible. You know, I, at one time I, uh, when the internet was first coming out, I remember in a search for God group, a gentleman said, you know, it'll be the best of things, but it'll also be the worst of things. And I think that, that the ways that we can use it as the best of things, I think and that needs to be done more. That purpose, it really is. It's wonderful. Yeah. Well, Herb, I want to respect your time. It's, it's been about an hour. I have uh, enjoyed this immensely and I'm looking forward to, to more collaboration, more conversation. So please let me know if there's anything I could ever do, um, you know, to be helpful as your book. Oh, 
<laughs> there's your there's your pet. <laughs> this is happy. Oh. How interesting. That was the name of my first dog, too. <laughs> well, let's keep in touch, and Peter, and thanks for the opportunity to chat with you and to share with you. And I look sure forward thing. to meeting you again. Thank you.